This is the second video in a series about what it takes to connect a floppy disk drive to an early Altair. Back in the days before MITS or any other computer manufacturer was making a disk drive for the Altair or early S100 computers. Um, in the first video, we went through the details of the hardware. We looked at what was in the computer, the disk drive we're going to interface, and then how that drive was connected to the computer. And now in this video, we're going to start the software development it takes to get this drive up and running with the uh, floppy, uh, with the computer. Now, in this video, we're going to just basically prove that we can get this drive to talk. We're going to try to seek a track and read and write some sectors. Uh, once we've got that, then in the next video, we'll actually go to trying to do something useful with this drive. Now, the software development environment we're going to use is called the MITS programming system. And this is a uh, cassette-based or paper tape-based for mass storage uh, assembly language development system. And it does all this in as little as 12 or 16K. And when you consider those constraints, it's amazing that it even works. But then again, as you can imagine, uh, with cassette or paper tape as your mass storage in that little RAM, it's, it's very difficult to use and it's very constricting. And as we introduced in the first video, our primary goal for doing this is to make a better development system out of this Altair by using the floppy drive instead of paper tape or cassette. All right, so let's go ahead and get this going. In order to save you the misery of watching me load this from cassette, I've got everything loaded already. This is a multi-step process to get this loaded. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, the very first step is to load what's called the monitor of the programming system into memory. This is done exactly the same as you would load BASIC, as you've seen in other videos. So we enter a bootstrap loader on the front panel, um, or in our case, like we mentioned earlier in the previous video, we have the multi-bootloader ROM. That saves us having to enter the bootstrap on the front panel. And then uh, that, of course, loads the checksum loader, which loads our monitor. All right, once the monitor is loaded, then you use the monitor to load the editor into memory from cassette and the assembler in the memory from cassette. But to do that, you first have to tell the monitor what device to use for loading binary files. And that's done with the open command. And the command to do that would be open abs comma ac. abs is the absolute file device that's for binary files, and ac is the audio cassette. So we issue that command, and now we can load the editor from cassette and then load the assembler from cassette. Once those are in memory, then we can enter the editor and use its load command to load our assembly language file that we've been working on. Now, before we can do that, we have to tell the monitor what device to use for loading text files. And that would be the open command with the file logical device. That is the device for loading source files. Again, we tell it the audio cassette, and then we have to follow that with A to indicate that it's an ASCII file stream as opposed to binary. Right, at that point, uh, we could then load the source file in the editor. But actually first, there was one more step. Before you do that, you have to tell the editor where in memory to place the edit buffer. So you have to patch four memory locations with the start address and the end address of the buffer. Once that is all done and you have loaded the source file from cassette, then you come back here and use the open command one more time. To set the source file, that's the file device, to point to the edit buffer. The edit buffer is in RAM, and what this means is that now when we assemble a file and the assembler calls for a source, a source file, instead of going to cassette, it will load it from the edit buffer, which is in memory. So now we're doing everything in memory, and the performance of this is pretty nice. You edit, assemble, test, edit, assemble, test, over and over again, all in memory. And again, that's pretty fast and not bad at all. Now, of course, if you're program goes astray and clobbers anything, you might have lost your changes, and you might have to start this whole process of loading all over again. Uh, this process, by the way, takes about 10 minutes, and it's not something you can just start and leave. You have to come back for each of these steps, so it's kind of a pain in the neck, as you can see. Um, now, occasionally you're going to want to save this file back out to tape, hopefully before the system crashes, and again, as you imagine, you'd have to come back here and set the file um, output device back to audio cassette before you did that. All right, so this you can see is the primary reason we're wanting to use floppy disks. This is painfully slow and miserable. Ten minutes just to get one file going. It's just not, it's not plausible to do any sort of serious software development. 
All right, but for now, all we're trying to do is get this disk drive to work. So let's go ahead and edit this file. That's the edt command. Now I have to put r in there to mean re-edit. Um, otherwise, if you just type edt, it would actually erase the file you have in there, which to me is completely backwards. You, you re-edit an existing file far more often than you start a new file. And I will probably patch this before this whole project is done so that edt doesn't erase a file. But anyway, let's take a look at this program. Um, let me grab a cheat sheet I have of positions in this file. All right, to get started, if you recall, I, um, in the hardware that we discussed in the original video, we made the point that we have to swap bits around because of the way this was cabled. It's very simple wiring, but that means we got to do some bit swapping here in software. And we also actually have to invert the data as well. So here you see the original values over in the comment field. And here is the value of all these different commands for the disk drive um, after they've been bit swapped and inverted. So again, these are just equates. This is static. None of this will have any performance penalty because we've done it all up here ahead of time. All right, so let's take a look at this program. So here's the main loop of the program. We're asking the user for a drive number. We ask the user for a track number. We ask the user for a sector number. Whoops. Um, and then we ask if they want to read or write. Now the, the track and sector numbers I get are just single digit. That just makes things a lot easier. and It'll be enough to prove that it works. If you choose the option to write, then I write the ASCII version of the drive number, sector number, and track number out to disk so that when we display it after reading, you can see that it's correct. And then we also fill the rest of that sector with just printable ASCII data so that we can see what's going on. Then when you do a read, you'll be able to see that we got the right data. All right, so let's go ahead and then take a look at the actual sector read and write routines. All right, so this is the sector read routine. Now these I've written to be full featured or robust, just like they'll be used in other routines. I'm hoping once I've proven them here, I can use them elsewhere. The first thing we do is go out and do a seek. This actually seeks to the track if needed and provides the drive number and the sector number that we're gonna read or write. All right, and then we actually issue the read command right here where it calls the do command with a read. That doesn't return until the drive has actually completed the read and has that whole sector in its own local memory. It's called a, in a FIFO, basically. Um, that's all done without having to use the computer at all. So that's why the speed of our computer makes no difference. So at this point, it's in the controller. If there's no error, we jump down here to transfer that sector to our own memory. Otherwise, we have a retry loop, and it'll try up to 10 times to get that sector read. Okay, so this transfer loop just takes the address that we've been given and the number of bytes, and this is the software handshake that we talked about, um, transfers it from the FIFO in the controller into our own memory. Now, it's important to note here that by the time I'm transferring the data from the FIFO into our memory, the head has already moved over the next sector. So there's no possible way to read consecutive sectors with this FIFO buffer in the middle. It alleviates us of any timing considerations, but it means the quickest we can read is every other sector. And we'll see how that comes into play uh, in a little bit later, probably in the next video. All right, if we look at the right sector routine, it's very, very similar. We do the seek, but first we load the buffer up in the controller so now the controller has all the data it needs and then we issue the write. Again, the controller does not have to access anything to do with the computer when it's time to do the real-time process of, of the write. All right, so if we keep going here. Here's the seek routine. The first thing the seek routine is called select and sector. Um, the select bits for the drive and the sector go in in one register, in one write in the controller. So those are done together. And then we actually do the seek to the track. This is a smart seek in that it actually reads a sector ID or a sector mark to see what track it's on. 
then determines how many steps to get where it needs to go, and then reads the sector mark on a track that it lands on to verify that it worked. And that's why we actually have a, a retry loop here, is because it'll know whether it worked or not. All right, and here is where we specify the sector and the sector number. The drive num, we hand off two bits because it's zero through three, put in the upper two bits, and then or in the sector number. All right, so let's take one look at, uh, Um, the actual the mapping of the bits, so the two th values that we actually have to swap the bits around at runtime are the sector number and the track number, as we mentioned in the previous video. So here are the instructions to do that. A couple rotates here, a couple rotates there, an and, and then a complement after we combine those. So it's a bit longer than I thought originally. This is about 30 microseconds as opposed to the 10 or 15 I was thinking. But again, 30 microseconds in terms of the time frame of a sector read or a, or a track step is absolutely nothing. And because of that concept of, of having to wait for every other sector, like I mentioned earlier, we're always waiting on the next sector. So this doesn't affect us at all. All right, so that's the whole program. And now exit back to the monitor and I can run the assembler to assemble this. All right, and to tell the assembler to take it from a file, it's now gonna to go to the FIL device like we saw. This will actually come from the edit buffer and now it'll do the assembly. Now that's a fairly long program. You see we're gonna be well over 300 lines in the end, but this finishes in about six seconds, six, seven seconds, because it's all in memory. So that's actually faster than it would have been on CPM or something like that. Now this undefined symbols is a heading and underneath that it would list all the undefined symbols. The fact that there's nothing under there means we had a good assembly. All right, so now we can run our program. I assembled it at 3C100 hex, which is 36,000 in octal, which is the only language this monitor accepts. So, whoops, we'll jump to that. By the way, the delete generates that underscore. So it's asking for the drive. We'll do, um, let's do drive zero, track six, and how about sector seven, and we'll do a write. If you listen, you'll hear it go. Oh, let me plug in this other disc while I'm here. All right, I'm going to zoom back so you can see this. So that got written. And you can see this light is on. That's the last drive it accessed. Okay, so now let's do drive one, track zero, sector one, and we'll do a right. And you'll see it come over here. All right, and let's do drive one again, track nine, sector eight, and we'll write that. All right, so you can see those seem to be working very quick. So now let's go back and read the first thing we did, which was drive zero, track six, sector seven. And we'll do a read. So you can see we came back here. Now let's take a look at what we got. Okay, so we have drive zero, track six, sector seven, and then starting with space, we have all the printable ASCII characters so it loops around back to space here again. So that seemed to work good. Let's go over to the other drive. We wrote uh, drive one, track zero, sector one. Let's read that. And so we have 101 like we expect. And then drive one, track nine, sector eight. Let's read that, 198, and again the ASCII data. So that seems to be working quite well. Of course, as you've expected, I might expect, I've done this with the drive cover off so I can see the head move. And yes, everything seems to be going to the right locations. So at this point, um, we've got the computer hardware all working. We've got software working to the point where we can prove the drive seems to work. And we have good looking routines for seeking a track, selecting the drive, and reading and writing sectors. So at this point, we are now ready to finally start writing some software to integrate this drive into that software development system so that maybe we can use the drive to speed things up instead of being stuck with that miserable cassette or paper tape interface we saw. So that's what we'll do in the next video and that will wrap up this video.